Okay, welcome everyone to the third lecture in the networking class. And this, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about application layer protocols and HTTP. And this is going to give you enough uh, information to really uh, get started and complete project one. Okay, so this is an important milestone in the class. Uh, last time, we finished up the first chapter of the book, which is this kind of overview of the internet. We mentioned how packets travel along many hops to reach their intended destination in the network. We didn't, we didn't really talk about how that all is coordinated and how that works. We'll talk about that later in the class. But just this idea of going through many hops, where each hop involves a router that receives the packet, queues it up, and um, forwards it further along toward it, the final destination. And each of those routers has a queue, which is like a, a memory for storing packets that haven't been sent yet. And that queue can fill up, and when those when that queue uh, fills up, then new packets that come in can't be stored anywhere, so they're dropped. Okay, so this store and forward uh, system with routers that uh, have queues where capacity is not reserved ahead of time, that's how the internet works, and because of that design, um, the internet's unreliable. Okay, so packets can be dropped anywhere along the way uh, because of uh, congestion, in other words, too much traffic, or um, Alternatively, another reason is if during a transmission from one router to another, if like a, a bit error was, detect, was detected, so if the data gets corrupted, then the, that pa packet wouldn't continue on because it would be um, it would be noticed, the corruption would be noticed. So in each one of these hops, there are four different kinds of packet delay. There are two that are associated with the router itself. So nodal processing, the router has to examine the packet to figure out what to do with it. And then queuing, in other words, the packet has to wait its turn to be sent. And you know, making the router faster essentially would reduce these two kinds of delay. But the other two kinds of delay associated with each hop are really associated with the, with the link uh, going out of that hop or coming into the hop, depending on how you look at it. And those are transmission and propagation delays, which we also looked at in the first lecture. We talked a little bit about the market forces that drive the development of the internet. Uh, we uh, describe the internet as a network of networks where we have a bunch of different local connectivity providers, which could be universities or um, telephone companies in a local area. But then we also have tier one ISPs, internet service providers, that connect these different access networks together with high speed backbone links. We also showed that there are many of these tier one ISPs that kind of compete with each other and serve different regions that they interconnect with each other through a process called peering. And peering usually happens without any payment, uh, any, any money being exchanged, because there's an incentive for both of the parties to connect to each other so they can provide each other with better access to the half of the internet, I guess, that, that each one has uh, access to. Um, even if each, even if a given network already has access to the whole internet it could be useful to to get a new to build a new connection in order to create a shorter path to reach um, some parts of the internet and that's how the internet gets faster over time as there's more uh, demand for faster connections between every pair of connections in the world i talked about layering which is this idea where we have many protocols on the internet to solve different problems and they build on top of each other and we'll talk more about this today and finally, I introduced sockets as a software abstraction of a network connection. And there are two different kinds of sockets called TCP and UDP, which we'll talk more about in um, chapter three. But for now, we need to know what sockets are at a very abstract level from like an application layer perspective, because these are things that we use to build applications that use the network. Um, we, it's just a connection that somehow um, gets data from you to some other party. It's one end of a pipe that you can send data in and out of, at least the TCP connection is, is uh, thought of as a pipe. We also have port numbers with sockets, and by having different port numbers that allows multiple network connections to exist on one computer. And the port number determines which of the many different uh, programs running on a computer is uh, going to receive a given packet. Okay. We're kind of going to review that a little bit today. Okay, so moving on. I already showed last time that there are different layers, different protocols that add their own headers to packets. And this 
This design is a, an instance of a very general software engineering principle called separation of concerns. Okay, so when we're building a network, we have many different problems to solve. And in order to make that problem tractable, it's, it, it's helpful to break the problem into, into sections, to divide the problem, to partition the problem, and then solve each, each piece separately, if that's possible. And it just so happens that you know, the, the internet stack, protocol stack, has been designed to have a bunch of, I guess, independent problems and independent protocols that solve those problems. Okay, so at the lowest level, we have link layer concerns. And each one of these is kind of a chapter in the book and is a, at least two lectures in this class. Um, at the link layer, we're dealing with how to share a physical channel with many different transmitters and receivers that are competing. At the network layer, we're figuring how to get packets from a source to a destination across a network where there are many different paths it could take and many different choices. Do I go left? Do I go, do, do I go right? You know, to simplify it and finding the shortest paths in the network to get good performance. That's that's a network layer. That's a very important layer. At the transport layer, we... Uh, hold on. At the transport layer, we uh, work on solving this problem where we have multiple... Pa we have to break our data into finite size packets and that these packets can be dropped when they're transmitted. So we deal with... Um, the reordering that can occur when we send packets, when we divide data into packets and they're sent independently. We introduce acknowledgements so that if a packet is dropped, it can be retransmitted. We also have mechanisms to control pacing so that we don't send data too quickly and overwhelm the network and therefore cause a lot of packet draws and then packet loss and they have to retransmit stuff. We also introduce port numbers to allow more than one connection per machine. So this transport layer is a very important um, part of the networking stack, but this is just one one part. Um, on top of that, we have session the session security layer where we add encryption and authentication, which solves you know another, that's an important subset of, of problems. We want security because we want to do things like um, e-commerce and banking online and, and private communication. And finally, at the very top of this design we have for the internet um, protocol stack, we have the HTTP application layer where we define um, client-server interactions using resource URLs and we have response codes, we have caching, content types, and compression. We'll talk about that today. Basically this is like... Okay. Alright, um, so today we're going to be talking about application layer protocols. And so we're taking a top-down approach to networking, so we're starting with the application. We want, you know, so software wants to be able to use a network to um, communicate with other instances of the same software or to communicate with um, servers that are storing data that is shared by the application. Um, the purpose of application layer protocols is to allow apps running on different commuter computers to communicate. It could be uh, different peers that need to talk to each other or it could be a client server kind of interaction. So we have both two different classes of, of networked applications in general, client-server applications and peer-to-peer -peer applications. Uh, when, when you, whenever you have sort of central control at a server, sort of like a, a computer that's in the cloud, we'll talk more about this later, that we call it a client-server model, where we have a bunch of computers that are kind of equal to each other, that are all participating in a more democratic way, I guess, we call those peer-to-peer -peer systems. But regardless of what kind of application it is, what kind of networking um, is used, these applications that software developers build, uh, we don't want those application developers to have to worry about the low-level details of the network. Like all most of those problems that I talked about in the previous slide, you know, things like the fact that packets could be dropped, um, the fact that it, the network has, you know, perhaps ten different hops between me and the final destination. We don't want applications to have to worry about those things and have to find solutions to those problems. So um, we end up using sockets, usually TCP sockets, that, that hide all those details from us. Okay. But what the applications do want to get, want to, to get access to is a, a way to send messages of arbitrary size to anyone else in the world. Okay. And that's what a socket kind of provides. Right? So every computer on the network has a unique IP address. Let's, for now, you can just think of these as numbers, like this is an IP version 4 IP address 
which is four numbers with dots in between them. Um, as long as you know the IP address of the other computer that you want to communicate with at, an app, at the application level, then you can create a connection and send data. Okay. Alternatively, if you don't have the IP address, you might have what's called a domain name or a host name, which could be something like cs.northwestern.edu. These are actually mapped to IP addresses by the system called DNS, which is the domain name system. Next lecture, we're going to talk in detail about that. But for now, I just want you to, to assume that every computer has either an IP address or a host name, and the application, and we can use that to establish a connection to it, uh, you know, to get the networking done, to exchange messages, to, to do whatever it is the application needs to do, right? All right, so with a client-server architecture, we have um, two different classes of machines. And uh, basically, we have these, you're all familiar with clients. Clients are like the machines that you use, whether they're laptops or smartphones or whatever. Um, servers are different in a few ways. Um, mainly, it's because they're always powered on. They have permanent IP addresses, like they don't move around. And so that, so that the clients can... Um, remember can have a long-term record of what the address is of the, the server that they need to talk with because that server is in one location. They're usually in data centers that provide them with reliable electricity and fast internet connections and a constant IP address. But what they don't have uh, that clients usually have are you know graphical interfaces. So there's no display or keyboard or mouse because there isn't someone sitting in front of the server using it. The purpose of the server was just to sit in a closet somewhere, essentially, and accept requests that come over the network. Okay, so these servers are sitting in a data center, listening for requests from clients, and they are in well-known locations, constant fixed locations, so that the, serv the clients know where to reach them on the network, even though the clients are um, different from the servers in that they can move around. Okay, so the clients are the opposite from servers in basically every way. They don't handle requests, they make requests. And um, they don't listen for messages. They, they, they send messages. Of course, they also receive data. Like, you can't build an application that only sends data and never gets anything back. Like, for example, a client might be running a um, mail application, right? Uh, with a mail application, you, you you fetch your messages. Like that's a request that goes to the server, get my messages. But the server has to send the data back, the, the message data itself back. Um, so the clients will will only listen for messages that are coming back from the server that that a server that they contacted recently. So in other words, um, the server is listening. The client sends a request. Like the request might say, "Give me my messages." And now at that point, since the client sent a request, it will now for a short period be listening for responses, but only for responses from that one server that it contacted. Okay, So these clients do not listen for unsolicited messages, they only accept responses to their requests. And they also don't communicate directly with other clients. And um, I guess you could stop and think about why they don't do that based on what I already said. Well, it really comes down to this uh, ability to listen. So if this, this other client down here is not listening for unsolicited messages, then um, the first client, if it tries to contact this other client, that, that second client will ignore it because it did not first... You know, if you just have two clients sitting out in the um, on the internet and neither one is listening to anyone, then neither one of them will, will, will be able to accept a connection. Okay. All right. But the servers are are listening for requests. So if you have a client server architecture, then all the communication has to happen through a server. Even if you have something like a messaging app, like whether it's you know Snapchat or some other texting application, all those messages have to go through a server because a server is the only kind of machine that is going to be listening for new connections. Okay. And we'll also talk about how you make sort of use push notifications to make this client get that message later on. That, that'll come later in the class. It's a little bit of a detail. Okay, so just to resummarize that, the key differences between clients and servers in this client-server architecture, and this is a very common architecture, is that the servers don't move. So because their location is the same physically, their their network address is the same, 
and that means it makes sense for them to listen for requests because um, they have a well-known address that clients could be like coded to send requests to. The clients, on the other hand, move around with users. Like they could be in someone's pocket as they move around. It could be a, a laptop that's moved around and plugged in different places, uh, whether wirelessly or, or in a wired manner. And because they move around, they're difficult to find on the network. And therefore, they do not listen for requests coming in from unknown machines. Also for security reasons, because they tend to be managed by, by users that are less um, you know, able to manage the security of, of their systems compared to servers. That's another reason why they don't listen for unsolicited requests. And the purpose of these clients is to provide a uh, software experience to users. And so as the user's clicking through things, uh, they'll end up making requests on the user's behalf uh, to servers to you know, send or receive data. Okay. And when they do that, they, when they, the only time they do listen for data is immediately after they send a request and they're waiting for a response from a server. And they're only waiting for that window of time um, is, rel is limited and it only pertains to that one IP address that the request was sent to. Okay, that's, that's because a socket was, was established between um, the one client and the one server with a particular pair of ports. Okay. Now by contrast, a peer-to-peer -peer architecture does not have servers per se. It just has a bunch of peers. Um, so these are computers, they could be you know, laptops or they could be desktops or servers, but if they're in a peer-to-peer -peer application, um, they all are equals in the sense that they all uh, listen for requests and have equal responsibilities. Okay. So these, these, this kind of architecture for applications does not rely on these powerful central servers to get work done. Instead, you have a bunch of kind of equal participants. And this is a more scalable design, actually, because notice that in the previous design, we had these servers on the, in the cloud that were, were involved kind of in the middle of every uh, client activity. So as you added more, as the more customers joined, you had to also add more servers to handle that capacity. And let's say you're developing a free application, like let's say Facebook, as more Facebook users come online, you have to add more Facebook servers. Now, the, the, you could be giving the software away for free to the users, so you don't have to pay for you know the smartphones that join Facebook, but you do have to start at paying for more servers to handle the capacity. Now, on the other hand, if this was a peer-to-peer -peer system, you could just give software to users who wanted to use the system and they would all kind of talk to each other. And by in, in doing that, they would, they would each be introducing their own capacity to run the network because they're, they're, the peers themselves, the clients in other words, are uh, introducing the capacity to handle work of the whole network. Okay. So this is a more scalable design, but it's much more difficult to manage because now you are relying on these mobile and short-lived participants to get all the work done in your system, right? Like it's much easier to build a system where you have these reliable, fast um, servers that you manage as the, as the software operator to get the important work done of let's say storing all the data, you know, all, if all your data is stored in on your own servers, then you don't have to, worry about if users can come and go but their data still stays in the cloud and it's, that's reliable on, on the servers. Um, if you were to try to implement let's say Facebook in a peer-to-peer -peer manner then the user profiles would be stored on let's say individuals machines and then if someone let's say lost their laptop then they would lose their Facebook account or something and then if someone else wanted to see their feed data they would have to you know the if I wanted to see my friend's feed data let's say that friend would have to have their laptop powered on at that time for me to get their data, right? And not, so not only is there, um, yeah, so the, these machines move around, they're powered off and on, um, their IP addresses change, they, there can be firewalls that block access to these machines. So for all these reasons, building a peer-to-peer -peer system to do anything of interest is really quite difficult. Um, but it is more scalable and, and it, you know, it doesn't require you to, to all you have to do is implement the software and hand it out and the system hopefully works on its own. Okay, so examples of peer-to-peer -peer systems are um, BitTorrent, 
Skype originally was a peer-to-peer -peer system, although these days there's a lot more centralized backend uh, processing that's used. Uh, the mail SMTP is the mail transport protocol. We'll talk about that at the end of this class. That you can think of that as peer-to-peer -peer as well. Okay. Now, one the first I think famous example of a peer-to-peer -peer system. This is a, was a relatively new idea. Um, early systems, network systems were um, really network applications really were all client server applications because it's an easier design to manage. Napster came around in 2000, uh, which was my first year in college. I remember it when it came out because colleges was campuses were really the, the biggest uh, customer base for Napster because, you know, at that time, college campuses were one of the few places where people had really fast internet connections. Uh, and it was an application for music sharings for MP MP3 sharing. This is also a time when, like, the MP soon after the MP3 codec was developed, so suddenly you could store a, a, a CD, a full album of data, in like one tenth of the capacity of the space that it that it w would be stored in in an uncompressed manner. Anyway, so this this application was designed to find music files on from across the world, so you could basically pirate pirate music, steal music, and uh, download it for free. Right, so this is very popular among students. Um, of course, totally illegal in a sense, well, in every sense, I guess. Um, but it did run for a while, and um, eventually it was shut down after several several copyright lawsuits from the music publishers. But the technical ideal that it, that it introduced was very influential, and this inspired BitTorrent, which is now a modern. Um, file sharing system built based on the same idea that's used for many legitimate reasons, legitimate purposes like uh, sharing um, operating system images for Linux, stuff like that. It's also used for some very, for, you know, sh for the same illegal, you know, file sharing that Napster was uh, popular for, like sharing movies and stuff, right? Um, well, I guess, okay, so just as a, to show it, at, at this time back in the, in the day, this shows that there there are nine thousand seven hundred and seventeen users online, and they're sharing one point seven million files. Okay, so this, the way this works is that every file you see listed here, it's not stored in a in a server anywhere. Each of these files is stored on one of the the active users' machines. So when you're when, if I were to download this this song here, um, it would the data would flow from this user JPKCR1 from their computer to my computer. It wouldn't, it wouldn't come from a, the cloud, per se. It would come from probably some other user in some other university dorm, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I want you to stop and think about why Napster decided to use a peer-to-peer -peer architecture instead of a traditional architecture where all the music would, was stored on servers centrally. Okay, so why was it important for Napster to use a peer-to-peer -peer architecture instead of a client-server architecture? Please stop and think about that. Okay, so there are several different reasons. So first of all, uh, the cost is much lower, right? Because the, the, there's, there's a lot of data here, um, especially in those days. You know, seven terabytes of data in those days would have to, would require like, um, you know, a hundred hard drives or something. It's like a lot of space. Um, so for someone to just, it's it's a lot. One person could write the software and just release it to the world. And then, you know, 10,000 users at any given time could use it to share files without that software developer having to, like, invest any money in servers or internet capacity or um, data center space to host those servers, right? So there's a cost advantage to, to, to uh, implementing this as a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. Now, that meant that it was a little bit harder to build the search, and the search was slower. So when you did a search... The system would have to actually send copies of that search request to a lot of different computers around the world that were participants in the network. So it was actually more difficult to implement the index and the searching than it would be if it was a centralized database. But that means the operational cost is much lower. Now, what, can you think of another reason? Now, the second reason is probably the most important one, which is that it gives it. It gave Napster some kind of legal protection, although you could see it was only short-lived because the system was shut down after like one year. Uh, you know, Napster, just like many tech companies for, since then, 
w would claim that oh it's not our fault that users are are sharing illegal files that they don't have the copyright for like we're just providing a, a, a platform a set of like pipes essentially or, or a software tool that allows people to exchange f files but it's the responsibility of those users to use the, the tool legally right so they, they had some plausible deniability that what they were doing was not unlawful they were just providing a software tool to allow people to share files right they weren't like Napster itself the company that developers who made it or didn't weren't personally storing any uh, music files they weren't transferring any music files themselves they were just providing a tool for other people to do that right so so they they provide a little bit of, of legal protection that let them operate for a little while before they were eventually shut down okay okay but it was shut down eventually but like I said it, it was it, its legacy is in being the first um, effective like large-scale peer-to-peer system um, for, for uh, network applications okay so moving on to and an, a new topic well not a new topic but so moving into a specific client server architecture we're gonna look at the hypertext transport protocol or HTTP this is um, the I guess most important client server application layer protocol that you'll find so we're gonna look at it in detail today and so this is you've seen the the letters HTTP at the beginning of like every web address right and that tells you that HTTP is the protocol that's used by web browsers to fetch pages from web servers so websites essentially are using the the hypertext transport protocol to transport their hypertext so hypertext is the same this is the same HT in HTML like hypertext markup language Okay, so this is a protocol designed for moving around HTML, basically. Now, HTTP is built on top of TCP. TCP is that uh, transport control protocol that we'll talk about in three, le two lectures from now. Not the next lecture, but the one after that. And several lectures. Um, TCP provides that reliable bidirectional pipe of, for data exchange between two machines so um, even though below the even though at a lower level if we really look at the data we'll see that there are packets like small packets are being transferred there are acknowledgments that confirm that packets were delivered there are numbers to allow the packets to be to be reassembled in the right order even though they may be re reordered while they're flowing uh, from source to destination all those details are are details of TCP but when we use TCP in an application layer and they in an application at the application level we don't worry about those details okay we just assume we have a reliable bidirectional data stream between two machines as long as we specify the endpoint we can get that connection okay so this is a client server data exchange protocol it has requests and responses that's the main thing about HTTP everything is um, a request and response interaction so the request, again, remember this was designed for uh, web pages. So we have a URL. There's also a method. We'll talk more about that, which is like the type of request, what it is you're doing. So the URL kind of specifies the document, and method says what you're doing with it. This could be something like get. Um, there could be a body in the request, but that's optional. And then, but the response has some headers that describe what you're getting back, a response code that basically tells you whether it was successful or not. And then there's the body, which is the document usually. So at a basic level, the request asks for a document using a URL, and the response gives that document back. Okay. We'll see that HTTP is a stateless protocol. Um, stateless means that every request is self-contained, and the server does not have to remember anything from previous requests to service any f future requests. So um, every request is self-contained. Every request can a request can go to one of many different servers. If you have multiple servers that are like providing uh, parallel service, like in a load balanced manner, uh, which is something that we talk about more in the CS three ten class, scalable software architectures. Yep. 
But to give an example, here's a little illustration. So this, this green box shows a HTTP request. And notice that I said before that, that these, these were human readable. What it means is that the data of the, like the HTTP data is text. It's ASCII text, okay? So like there are letters and numbers and punctuation. Uh, there's, there's no random binary. You can't just send any zero, you won't find just any zeros and ones in this uh, data. You'll find only the patterns of zeros and ones that translate into ASCII uh, characters so, so that you can read it as a human. And it can, But of course, this, these aren't designed for humans to read, but it, um, you have programs that, that generate this, these requests and, and parse them, but it also can be read pretty easily by a human looking at it. Anyway, okay, so this request has several lines at the beginning. These are all part of the header, the HTTP header, that kind of control what, what the request is asking for. There's a blank line, and then after the blank line, there could be a body. So with HTTP, whether we're talking about request or response, we always have a header and a body, and there's also always an end, sorry, a blank line between the request and the body, although the body could be absent, in which case there's no um, blank line at all. In the header, every line, we call um, each line a header, and the headers have like a, a, uh, a name, a colon, and a value. So um, this, and then the first line is, it specifies, is the request line that specifies the URL and the method. So the first word here, get, is, is one of several choices for what you're doing to the document. And then you have this, the name of the document, which is the URL here and finally there's a, the version of the protocol you're using and that's it the response also has the a first line is a status line that has like a summary which in this case 200 is the 200 okay means it was successful basically there are different numbers and and short um, response phrases that correspond with different numbers for for different kinds of failures that have different numbers different than 200 and then you have several headers that, that are give more information about the response. And then, then, and then once you're done with the headers, there's a blank line, and then there's the body, which in this case is an HTML document. So we were getting test.html under the doc like folder, I guess. And this is the data for the file, but then you also have more information about the file up here, like what was the last modified time, how long is it, the content length, the content type. This is This is kind of the replacement for the file name extensions that you have on a computer that tell you what kind of file it is. This content type tells you what kind of data is coming in the body. And and what's generating these requests is web browsers. What's generating the responses is web servers, but then those responses are read by the web servers, by web, sorry, web browsers, and then rendered graphically on the screen for users. Okay. Okay, so just to go through the process of an HTTP transaction, we have a client that's running a web browser, probably. That client, um, someone clicks a link in a web browser, let's say, that triggers the browser to make a new HTTP request to fetch that document that's associated with the link, right? Fetch that URL, basically, right? First thing that the client has to do is create a TCP socket, which is going to be the um, bidirectional pipe or stream of data between the client and the server. Okay, there's a lot of details that go into, this is the abstraction of the network and the retransmissions that have to happen if packets are lost and a lot of other stuff. So, um, but at an application level, we can just think of this as one simple thing, a connection between the client as a, and a server, as long as we know the server IP address or host name, and we know what port number we want to connect to on the server, we can create a socket in software in like, you know, one or two lines of code very simply. And then we can, once it's established, we can start sending data. So the client creates that TCP socket. The server accepts the socket. And then the client can start sending its request. So the client constructs the request following the HTTP, HTTP protocol. Okay, so here's an example of a request that might be sending. And it sends that data into the socket. So this, this socket accepts a stream of data, so it just sends kind of like, you can think of it one byte at a time from beginning to end. Until it gets to the end, and then it has no more data to send, so that's it. 
Once it sends that request, the client starts listening on the socket. Remember, this is a bi-directional socket. So data can come in, actually, the data can come back at any time, even before it sends anything. But with HTTP, it, the client knows that if it has not sent anything, it should not expect to get anything back. So after it sends this request, it starts listening on the, in the other direction, the received side of the socket. So the server notices that there's new data uh, because, because this socket will, will notify the, the, the server application that there's new data available. And it starts reading that request data. Eventually, it gets a copy of that data by reading, uh, by continuing to read from the socket. At some point, the server notices that it has received a full HTTP request. Now, one important thing about TCP sockets is that it doesn't, it's not like a packet or message oriented um, connection. It's just a stream. So there's nothing that tells the server that this message is over, like when this message is over, except for the data inside of it. So this. This packet actually contains the data that tells uh, the receiver when to stop reading. And in particular, this content length down here and this new line, both are signals that the, the server can use to determine whether or not it's received this whole first um, request, right? So until there's a new line, the server knows that it has not read all the, the headers. And after it gets a new line, it can look at the content length to know how much body to expect. So there are 35 characters down here. And once it's received 35 characters, it knows it's gotten the full request. Okay, so the server now has an HTTP request and whatever program is running on there to, to handle uh, HTTP requests will run and it'll generate some kind of response. So in particular, for example, what it might do is look at the URL and say, oh, this, te it, this might correspond to a path in the file system of the server where there's a file called test.html that can be fetched and returned in, in a very simple case. Or there might be a program that, that runs to check a database to get data and then generate that and then fill in a template and return that HTML. Anyway, like the details of how the server generates the appropriate response uh, depend on the application. But somehow the server decides what the appropriate response is, what document should be returned for this particular GET request, and it generates the response, and it sends it back on the uh, in the other direction of that TCP socket where that it received the request in. The client notices that there's new data, and then you know just like in the other direction, the client reads until eventually realizes it has gotten a full response using the same strategy where it it continues reading until it sees a new line, then it knows a blank line, then that, that's how it knows that um, the header is finished, and then it might check for a content length to see how much data um, it's expecting to get in the body, and it'll continue to read until it gets that. Because this data is not all gonna arrive at once in, this, in the application. You'll see that when you're writing your solution to project one. Okay, I mentioned before these, these content length headers tell, um, it just so happens these are the same, that was just coincidence, um, and actually this one down here isn't, should, maybe shouldn't be 35, if you count the letters it's not 35, so I'm not sure why that image shows 35, but um, yeah, these tell the, re the receiver how much uh, body data there there is. Okay, so HTTP has URLs in the requests to specify like what document it is that you're requesting, what data it is that you're requesting, or, or more generally what you're doing. But there's more There's more to the requests than just different URLs. There also are different methods that can be applied to the same URL. So get is the most basic one. That's what we saw before. When the client sends a get request, it's asking for data. There also is a post uh, method for supplying data. That's when the client is pushing data to the server. And uh, put and delete and head are similar. Well, put and delete, put is similar to post where the client is, 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 is pushing data to the server. Um, delete can be applied to a URL to kind of, to delete a document in a sense. This might not be, whether or not the server should allow this to happen, of course, is up to the server. And, and head is like get, but it, it just returns the header, not the body. So these are like less commonly used. 
Uh, but just you should know that there are two there are at least two different methods you can apply to the same URL depending on whether the client is, is simply downloading data or providing data. Okay. And there are different response codes. We saw 200 OK for a successful response. You might also see a 300 level uh, error or response, I should say. It's not really an error that tells the client that what, are, what they requested is available in a, in a new location. So it's a redirection so that the response provides another URL in the location header and then the client should make another request um, and you'll see that in the homework. There also are two different kinds of errors, client errors and server errors. Uh, 400 level errors mean that the client did something wrong, like for example they might not have permission to access a certain URL, in which case they would get a 403 error back. A 404 error is not found, you've probably seen this when browsing the web, if you click a link that's misspelled or obsolete this means that the server like doesn't understand, doesn't recognize that URL basically. Then also there, 500 internal server error is a generic thing um, that allows the server to just tell the client that something went wrong internally, like maybe the the code running in the web server crashed or something like that. So th that's not really expected. I just said that there uh, the HTTP allows for the um, post method to be used instead of get for the, the client to provide data. The earliest example of this, like what, what this was designed for originally in the early days of HTTP in the web was for forms on web pages. Okay, so think of a login form. So this, this screenshot shows a little snippet of a sample web page where you might enter a username and password. Okay, you wanna be able to send this to the server. So you're not really like fetching a page exactly but you are providing data to the server and the server is going to give you something back. We'll see what it is in a second. But so this image here, this screenshot corresponds to this simple HTML down here. I mean, I don't know if you all, you probably all don't know HTML, but in case you do, this is like the code that would generate this form. And uh, you can see actually that in the form, you can specify the method you want to use in the request. And also this action down to the right of that shows the URL, both of these things end up being used in the request that the browser sends. So when you click send on a form like this, depending on the code you've entered in your form code in the HTML, the browser will send a post request to some server to handle that, right? So the post, so the met, so is this an HTTP request with the verb being post, the method being post, uh, that comes from the this uh, field here on the left hand side of uh, inside the form. The URL slash API slash login also comes from that form tag in the HTML. Um, and then at the very bottom th there's some data which says you know user equals Peter, Peter Pan PW for password equals something action equals login. This is data that came in part from the form. So the username up here there's this input down uh, element that has name user, that's where the, sorry, I guess the case of this user and this user should match, that's my mistake. Um, Peter Pan was the data that was entered inside here, password came from the second input. There also is a hidden field here uh, that has a value, a na name action value login, that's where this last one came from. And I think actually it would also send um, submit uh, it would it would send uh, this value send somewhere that that's missing though. It'd say submit. Um, well, if there's no name, it might not send it though. I don't know. Anyway, and finally, um, there's a header here for referrer, which lists the URL of the page that this form was on, because that might be useful to the back to the server to decide how to handle this. So this request goes to the to a server. This particular. Um, In this case, since the action was just slash something, which didn't have a new domain, this will go to the same server that this um, page is on, whatever URL, whatever host name is at the beginning of this URL. So somewebsite.com will be the server this goes to. Now in response to that, that login request, what typically happens is that a redirection response is, is given back, 302 which um, 
provides the new page that the user should go to after they successfully logged in. But there also is a um, cookie that's sent back. Okay, so cookies are a really uh, interesting feature of HTTP that allows a stateless protocol to support um, stateful applications, essentially. Like from the applications perspective, you might have a website that has users that, that where the order of things that users do is important. Like for example, in order to access my account page on let's say eBay, I have to first log into eBay, right? If I, if I just open up a browser and go straight to eBay and try to see an account, I shouldn't be able to see anyone's account if I have not first logged in, right? There is a certain amount of like history that's needed, a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of state at the application level that is needed to make the application work well. But HTTP itself does not support state. So cookies are, are things that, that pull state out of the, pro, out of the um, HTTP protocol and put it in the application layer to allow um, the protocol to be stateless. Okay, so the, that, that was a lot of words. Like, to see how that works, we really just need to see an example. Okay, so like I just showed before, the imagine that same password, lo that login request is sent to the server. Of course, the server, the, so the server's gonna get that. The server gets this, this request here. At the very bottom, it has a username and password. The server, of course, is gonna check to see whether this username and password match what is stored in, in the database. In other words, is this password correct? Is this a real user and is this password correct? So the server will check a database to see whether that's true. If it is true, assuming that you know, it's a valid login, then the database will generate a random number for the session, which is called a cookie. It'll store that in the database. It'll say, okay, now this user is assigned to this cookie. This has a valid cookie, which is essentially a new password that's that's available, that's used just for one network connection or one browser, actually, let's say. Uh, and it'll send that cookie back to the client to use in future requests. So essentially giving the giving the browser a new password, a, like a session password kind of, to, and, and this special set cookie header will cause this key value pair, this um, cookie name and cookie value to be stored in the browser associated with this domain name, uh, whatever domain you're at where you made this request. So any future request to the same domain, some website.com, the, the browser will automatically add, as you see on the bottom here in this purple request, will add a cookie header, which, which gives back, um, which repeats that cookie name and cookie value that were previously set by the server. So now every future request on this domain from this particular browser will provide a password basically with every request. I mean, it's not exactly a password, it's a cookie, which is a random number generated by the server and associated with this user and will in the future be recognized by the server as signifying that this user had previously logged in. Okay, so when the, when the server gets this purple request that says get slash account, so this is the, the browser asking to load the account page um, it's, it's, it's at subwebsite.com. Now that by itself is something that should not, that the server shouldn't accept because it won't know what user you're asking about. It won't know that you have permissions to see that user's account information, except for the fact that you're also including this cookie header, which the server can use to look up, take this value, look it up, check its database to see whether this cookie was previously generated by the server, and if so, for what user was it generated. And that will tell the server that, okay, this request is actually coming from a browser that had previously logged in, and this is the user for that browser, okay? Now, this, this means that um, if your browser has a cookie, it needs to keep that safe and not allow hackers to get it and not, you know, share it to other random browsers, um, stuff like that. Okay, because it's basically a temporary password. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. Is HTTP protocol still stateless, even though it's using cookies to um, track the history of users? So is the protocol stateless? And how is the protocol stateless, even though cookies are used?
Okay, so I hope you thought about that. I mean, the, the answer, I, I didn't lie to you. HTTP is stateless. So um, the reason it's stateless is because this this purple request down here, if, it can go to any, um, like it doesn't actually depend. This request does not depend on any previous requests being sent in order for it to work. Like this actually stores everything that's needed to get the work to, to be accepted by the server, to be handled by the server. Um, it's just it's just that this request includes some state in it. So the, the, the state that is required to make this request work, like the user identity, is explicitly spelled out in the request. Okay. So like in other words, you don't have to the server doesn't have to remember that this request came from a previous from a browser that previously logged in because the browser is reminding the server every single time it makes a request who it is. Like it's sending this cookie every time. So it's like it's including the, all the necessary reminders in every request of all the inform all the information about the history that the server needs to know is included in every in every request in the form of cookies. Okay. So the protocol is still stateless. All right, um, just as a quick variation to see a little bit more about how this works, you can take the same form and change the HTTP method from post to get. See how this, this yellow part changed? And that will cause the browser to send a slightly different request. Instead of a post, it's now a get type request. And instead of having parameters down here in the body, um, usually they will be encoded as query parameters. That's where you take the URL, you add a question mark, and you have uh, a key key value pairs separated by ampersands. Okay. There's also a variation of this where you can um, uh, well, yeah. If it was a post request, then then you could store the um, form data. I'm not sure actually if form data can be stored in the body of the get request, but usually it's query parameters like this. The reason I'm showing you this is to show that the URLs themselves can um, encode parameters in get, in, in get requests. Notice that when we did this, we had to do some translations. So um, like the, the username in this case uh, was uh, Peter Lee, and there's a space between Peter and Lee. Now you cannot have spaces in, in URLs. So uh, there's a, the rules for URL encoding specify that a space has to become either plus or percent twenty. Um, and in this case, it has a plus. Okay. All right. So to go over a little history here, um, HTTP was invented in the early '90s uh, by I guess Tim Berners-Lee at CERN for, um, for for building the first websites, right? Which were providing information for physics. Uh, researchers. So this was, a, in the early days, it was just a document fetching service. And the kinds of documents that were fetched were like files that were stored on servers. And so the web servers would not do a lot of work. They would just look for f static for files that were already stored on uh, that match the URL and return those back. Whether they were HTML files or image files, um, that's kind of like the original early web was really just like HTML images and CSS and other like a few kinds of files. And your project one is basically implementing an early 90s style um, web server. Later on though, um, you know, the web be became more, uh, I guess the applications running on the web became more powerful and dynamic web pages uh, st started to be used. So we had we have um, web servers that, that accept requests for which there's not an, a document that verbatim is going to be returned, like a file that verbatim is going to be returned, but rather there's some code that needs to run on the back ends on the server to generate some content on demand that's appropriate for that request. So you can think of something like eBay or any, like eBay was one of the very early um, dynamic e-commerce web pages, right? Um, you have a server or a set of servers that has a database that lists, has information about the different items that are for sale and uh, the different browsers accessing it or you know, fetching information about different products or auctions. And that URL might have a product number in it. And when the 
server gets that request, you know, it's not going to just find a file that has all the information about that product or that auction pre-generated because that information changes over time, like the, the bids on an auction change uh, over time. So the price changes over time. So the server has to check a database to get all the information necessary to, to generate that content and it might fill in a template to like what to plug in different values that it gets from the database. Uh, but that's a dynamic web server. And that, that started in the, in the late 90s. So the web continued to evolve, become more important, and eventually um, JavaScript became uh, was introduced and it allowed pages to be interactive. And not just in the early days, pages were interactive, but only in the sense that you clicked a link and you went to a new page. But JavaScript kind of allows the, the page to become an application that, ch that where the, 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 what you see changes, not just because you're going to a new page, but because it, uh, JavaScript you know, changes on demand. And you, so you had something like the evolution towards today's single page applications started with Gmail and Google Maps, which are both applications that um, it didn't make sense to have like a separate URL or a separate page for everything as you moved around. You wanted to be able to like, you know, drag and move the, the map. Like the map, I, Google Maps really was the first um, web 2.0 application, which was use JavaScript to be in interactive without like loading new pages all the time. So with that, uh, the Ajax uh, extension to HTTP and to browsers allowed um, requests, web requests to happen not just when you're navigating to new pages, but while you're on a page and doing things. The browser would make HTTP requests to fetch new pieces of the data, like new tiles on a map, for example, or to uh, make changes to the state on the back end. Like if you delete a message in Gmail, that would might not change what page you're on exactly. You might still be looking at your inbox, but the browser sends an HTTP, let's say, delete request to the back end, to the server, to tell it to delete a message, something like that. Um, and, and then in this the most recent decade, in the 2010s, HTTP spread beyond just web applications, and now it's used as kind of a generic response request um, framework for any kind of software applications that need to interact in this kind of request response manner. The reason, so HTTP is used for much more than just web pages nowadays. That's, that's the important lesson. And the reason was that um, up until 2010, uh, you know, web browsers became more sophisticated. And, and so HTTP had to support a lot more variations of requests to the point where it became pretty um, flexible. And you already had all these this HTTP infrastructure that was built and was robust. So there were like li there were libraries in every programming language to use HTTP. Uh, there are caches and proxies built in to to let um, you scale and operate HTTP services well. You have encryption and compression um, that's built into HTTP with you know additional uh, libraries. So HTTP became a convenient. Uh, building point for all client server interactions. So even like when you have a smart when you're using a smartphone app, like let's say it's a, a game, even though it's not a web browser, it's not you're not moving through URLs, but still that smartphone game, that app is probably using HTTP to uh, interact with its backend to you know fetch data and update the backend on the things you're doing in the game. You know, same thing. Server to server communication these days very often also uses HTTP, um, even though again it's not a, you don't it's not a, uh, an instance of of a user going through web pages, um, so it's but it's still using HTTP, which was designed for that purpose, just because you know one one server is asking for something from another server, and HTTP is a common like way to encode those requests. So when we have those server-to-server -server interactions using HTTP, very often we call those REST APIs. Uh, REST stands for Representational State Transfer, I think. It's kind of a weird acronym, but anyway, it's like a, a by an API we just mean a um, you know a def definition of a programmatic interface over the network. So, for example, we could, and this this is covered in more detail in this CS three ten uh, scalable software architectures course. But um, you could have a we a weather service, weather information service, for example, 
And so there's a server api.weather.com that accepts requests using this HTTP style. So it's kind of like you're visiting different web pages, except they're not web pages. They're just what we call REST endpoints, which are like URLs that provide data back. And the, the data comes, so you're not, you're not getting an HTML page, which is like gonna be rendered in a browser that's meant for a user to see, but instead you're getting this JSON data. So JSON is the JavaScript object notation. It's just a format for uh, storing data in text. And so, yeah, so here's some information about the weather that corresponds to the request that I made. So we, we, we I mean, notice that we modified the URL to control like what kind of weather request we're making. So we're asking for the forecast in location equals San Francisco. And what the response we got back was a set of information about the, the forecast in San Francisco. Okay, so we're using HTTP to support uh, a networked API, a REST API, for one program to access uh, another program, basically. And so these links are, um, show examples of REST APIs. Uh, I'm not going to go, you can spend more time on your own going through these, I guess. But just an example of here. Here's like a. This is a made-up example for a pet store that might have an API to allow other applications to control, to access its data and control the pet store. So you can, um, for example, uh, add a new pet to the store, which involves making a post request to the slash pet URL, and you have to provide some data in your in your body, in your request body to uh, create that pet. Um, and you notice that the way that these REST APIs are organized is usually by using the URL to specify the, the data that you're modifying and using the verb or the, sorry, the method to specify what you're doing with that data. Like, are you creating a new pet? Then you're posting a pet. You can also get pet to just get information about that pet, right? And then if, but you, of course you have to specify the pet ID after, in the, as part of the URL as a second level. Um, to tell the, the server which pet you're trying to get the information for. Okay, also like delete slash pet slash uh, ID would would delete a certain pet that had been created previously. This is all using a common uh, set of URLs, but with different methods, depending on what you're doing with those objects, okay? And basically you define different paths to control the different, uh, like objects in the system. Like you have users, you have the store itself, you have pets. Those all have different paths associated with them. Okay. That was a fake uh, API. You can also look at this Twitter API for a, a real example of REST API that's much more complicated. That's for uh, programmers to control data that's on Twitter, whether they're fetching Twitter, Twitter data or like creating tweets programmatically. Their way. Okay, so if you're designing a REST API, and I, I'm sure many of you will do that um, as you when you start your, your careers in software engineering, you you have a lot of flexibility, right? You're given if you're using a REST if you're using REST as the basis for your API, then basically all that you're you're doing is you've decided that you're going to use HTTP. But how we use HTTP is up to you and when you as the API designer, so with an API in general, you have inputs and you have outputs and you have to, you get to choose like where your inputs are encoded and, and where your outputs are encoded. Uh, but because you're using HTTP, you're, that kind of limits the options, right? So one of the inputs you have is a choice of which of the different HTTP methods you're going to use, like whether you a get, post, or put, or delete. And that choice is pretty straightforward depending on what you're doing. Uh, I guess the most important choice is what the URL is. And like I said before, usually this identifies some kind of object that the request is, is modifying. But it can also supply parameters like we saw before, delete slash pet slash 35 would be deleting pet number 35. Okay, so um, if you're controlling which object you're modifying, then that can be part of the URL. You also can have query parameters after the URL. So remember that question mark something equals something, that's part of the URL, but it's actually a parameter um, that's being supplied. 
And then finally, you can include a body, which can be arbitrary um, JSON data usually for REST APIs. Okay, so this, this gives you ultimate control of what, you pro what you're providing, uh, what kinds of things you can provide. In the response, uh, there's a status code. I mean, this, this is very commonly, it's easy to see how to use this usually. The 200 means there was, it was successful, and then things like 404 or 403 can be used when they're either the URL was invalid somehow, like for example, you tried to delete a pet with some numeric ID that didn't exist in the system, that should give maybe a 404 error, not found. 403 is a forbidden error, that could be if you are trying to delete someone else's pet, let's say, um, that shouldn't be allowed, so the server could give a 403 error. And then um, you have the body of the HTTP response, which usually would be JSON encoded for a REST API. Um, technically, HTTP also has uh, headers that you can control and in both the request and the response, but it is, I would say, bad style to to change to control these headers in your REST API. Like for example, if you supplied the pet ID as a header in the request, that's technically possible. Uh, but by doing that, you're really kind of modifying um, HTTP. Like the headers are a place are usually not not touched by the applications. So um, usually the headers are used for the for the HTTP level um, protocol level um, functions rather than the application le level functions above that so just as a point of um, recommendation I wouldn't modify those in, in your rest API I wouldn't use those in your rest API okay so I, I said before the HTTP was used as a basis for a lot of applications APIs why do this? I already said this before, uh, but the web communities, you know, from the early 90s to today, and especially in those first 15 years before HTTP became the standard for basically for most um, application layer protocols, um, the web community had solved most of the problems you're likely to face, including encryption, compression, uh, providing libraries in pretty much in every programming language, basically, to both act as a HTTP client to build the request and also to act as an HTTP server. There are many different server frameworks and lots of languages to choose from that already handle this like encryption, queuing of, of requests to handle them individually, database connection pooling, stuff like that. Um, so like Apache is a very common uh, old web server that you can uh, use. Tomcat is a Java language web server. Node, of course, is the the standard JavaScript web server, Django and Flask both uh, work with Python to implement web servers. So the fact that this stuff already exists for the purpose of web pages means you can kind of reuse that stuff for um, generic APIs that are not necessarily web pages. We also have web proxies that and caches that can be reused for your applications as well as web pages. So the Squid and Nginx are two open source software applications for proxying and caching. Um, what that means is not, I'm not, I don't think we have time to really go into that in super detail, but that's covered more in this, in the 310 class. Um, content delivery networks like Akamai already exist for web pages. You can reuse those for your APIs um, as well. Some of the uh, disadvantages of using HTTP for new applications are that you get a little bit more complexity than you necessarily need. And that might lead to some unexpected behaviors. Um, the human readability of HTTP makes it a little bit more bloated than it, your packets probably need to be, but compression helps with that, which and compression is built in. Um, and then again, if you're if you're using the REST style of APIs using HTTP, then you you try you have to kind of translate your requests into things that use verbs like put and post combined with a URL. And sometimes that's that's awkward. Um, like for example, if you're, uh, if you're, yeah, some kinds of requests like uh, just don't fit that object model because you're not, you're not modifying an object. You're not always modifying an object. Um, sometimes you're just doing things that have multiple effects in the system that are difficult to translate into uh, one object that's being modified. All right, so that was HTTP. 
Okay, if you want a break, now might be a good time to take one. So moving on to another application layer protocol, we have the simple mail transport protocol, SMTP. Okay, this is also built on top of TCP. So we have sockets that provide reliable bidirectional data transfer when we're sending mail. We don't have to worry about at the application layer dealing with packet losses and retransmissions and, and uh, data corruptions and stuff like that. We assume that TCP takes care of that for us. Um, this is actually an earlier protocol than HTTP. It's defined in RFC 2821. So RFCs are the documents that define internet standards. You can actually read these. They're pretty easy to understand. They define basically how the protocol works. Uh, mail uses port 25 by default. So HTTP uses port 80. I don't know if I mentioned that. I guess I did in an earlier lecture. And this was invented in 1982, which is before HTTP. So this is like the internet's first popular application was, was email. Now this is actually sort of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol among servers. Okay, you have a bunch of mail. There's not like one mail server. There are a bunch of mail servers, each for a different domain. So for example, in the upper left, we might have the Northwestern mail server. On the right-hand side, we might have like the Gmail web server. And you know, down here, we might have a different one. And if you're sending mail to a user that's like Tarzi at Northwestern.edu, what your mail server does to do that is it, it, it does a particular kind of DNS request to basically to look up what is the IP address of the mail server for northwestern.edu. I'll show you, I'll give an example of that later on, how that works on the command line. You can actually do it yourself. So it, it finds which of the many, you know, thousands or millions, I don't know how many, of mail servers it sh the message should go to. And it uses the SMT protocol to communicate, to send that message to that um, server of the recipient, basically. So mail servers have two roles in the system. They're both senders and receivers. And that's why it's called, I consider it a peer-to-peer -peer system, right? So when, when someone at Northwestern.edu is sending mail, that Northwestern mail server will, will find the appropriate um, mail server for the receiver and, and initiate a connection to send the message. But that same mail server also is gonna be listening for mail messages from other mail servers. Okay, so all the mail servers are kind of talking to each other as they need to deliver mail to different domains. So the e all the e email addresses at whatever, each domain, if it's different, it means there's a different mail server that is responsible for accepting those messages. Okay. There also are user agents. So there are actually two different sets of protocols here, which are different. And, and it, so for example, if I'm a Northwestern email user, I have a user agent, which in my case is like the app running on my iPhone and the app running on my laptop. Those use the IMAP protocol to connect to my, my mail server. And so when I actually write out a message, it uses the, and I hit send, that application uses the IMAP protocol to send the message to the mail server. That's different than the SMT protocol, SMTP protocol that's used between mail servers, okay? Because there are a lot of different variations of user agents. That's why there are different protocols here. So for example, Gmail, it, it, it does support IMAP, but primarily the user agents for Gmail are a web page. So people go to gmail.com to view their messages and also to send messages. So this is a, so you might have, you have users accessing a browser and then that browser connects to a web server and that web server connects to the mail server to initiate the sends and to collect the appropriate messages for the users. Okay, so today we're not really talking about the user agents. We're just talking about the mail servers and there's no authentication here. Like there are no passwords that are needed. The passwords are needed to, for the user agents to authenticate with the mail servers. And each of these different mail servers can have its own scheme for deciding what kind of passwords are used, whether passwords are used, and how those passwords are exchanged with the mail servers. That, those are, that's basically what the IMAP and POP3 protocols and the different web mails uh, do. Okay. But anyways, for the, for the SMTP protocol that happens between the different mail servers, there's this, there's this protocol that, that was invented in 1982, like I said, uh, that has a series of exchanges between the server and the client to 
to transfer the message basically. So I'm showing here the interaction between server and client and I'm using the term server and client even though it's a peer-to-peer -peer system because in any given exchange one of the participants is the server is the server and one is the client. So in other words the sender is the client, the receiver is the server. That role of course can flip depending on whether a given machine is at any given time, uh, you know, Northwestern sometimes sends mail, sometimes Northwestern receives mail, and so the, the role of client and server changes over time. So, um, yeah, the client connects to a, to the server. It sends, it, uh, there's certain messages it has to send, like it has to say hello first, and um, then it, it starts by sending this mail line, which sa says who the message is from. The server acknowledges it by saying okay. The client then says, who the message is to, the, the server acknowledges it by saying OK, and continues. Eventually it says data to say that it's finished specifying who the message is from and to. Now it's going to send the message itself. And then um, the client sends the data of the message, followed by um, whatever, sorry, followed by this period at the end, which on a new line which signifies the end, and then the server accepts it. Okay, So this is a bunch of messages of exchanges between the client and the a mail client and a mail server to compose a single message okay there's a little bit of repetition here because there actually are two kinds of headers the, the the from and to listed first are what's actually used to deliver the message like the two here the twos that are listed here are actually what the server will use to deliver the message but then down here the two that's listed is what will show up to the user which could be different Okay, so like this CC here appears in the um, in the the mail application that's viewing the message, but to the server, they're both the two and the CC appear as twos because it's kind of the, the function of CC and two is really the same from a tr network um, level. So how is this different than HTTP abstractly as a, as an application layer protocol? I mean, obviously, like. There, there, I don't want you to think about the details of, apart from the fact that you know everything here is designed around emails like there are things like um, users with, with addresses and um, you know there's dates and stuff subjects don't think about those details but just at a high level from, in terms of how the, the protocol is designed how is this style of protocol different than HTTP that we saw for web pages please stop and think about that All right, so the big difference here is that it's stateful. And you may not have thought of that word, but one thing you may have noticed is that there are a whole bunch of exchanges that happen sequentially in order to make this one message send. Okay, so um, like the server, this client says, the client says a bunch of things related to the message separately in pieces, and the server acknowledges them one piece at a time before eventually it gets everything it needs to send the message and then it's done, right? So the server needs to actually remember these old things. <laughs> uh, the server, like w w when the server receives this message he in this big part of the message down here, um, in order to actually process this, it needs to remember that earlier on the client said who the message was from and who it's going to, okay? So that's why it's a stateful protocol. The, um, there are several steps involved in uh, getting the work done, and the server has to remember all those steps in order to do it. Okay. So the next thing is I want to give a little demonstration of this, just because you may wonder actually why this was designed to be stateful, and in this weird way. Um, you know, so just to hammer down uh, home that that difference. If this was HTTP, like all this, all these client lines would be combined into one big message and sent to the server and the server would say okay now I have all the information at once that I need to send this message and therefore I'll do it that would make it that would translate this into a stateless protocol if everything was sent at once but it's not and the reason it wasn't uh, it's not it wasn't designed to be stateless is because this was designed in 1982 for people to actually manually operate this protocol by typing this stuff in okay so this is designed for you to actually type out the protocol. So for example, I can create a um, 
if I want to send a message to myself, I, I need to figure out what the uh, mail server is for a domain. So I'm going to look up stevetarzy.com, which is a domain I use for my personal email. Uh, I guess I made this a little bit too big. So the, let me make this a little bit smaller, sorry. I did a special type of DNS lookup on the command line uh, called NSLOOKUP. Okay, so now you can see it all at once. So this NSLOOKUP type equals MX means I'm, I'm querying for a mail exchanger for st stevetarzy.com. And the answer I got was that the mail exchanger for stevetarzy.com is mailed at stevetarzy.com. Okay, so this is the server I need to connect to to send a mail message. Okay. So now I'm going to connect to that uh, machine on port 25. Use, I'm going to create a TCP connection on the command line. Um, I think I got the order wrong. Okay. So this line, telnet space mail that space 25, created a TCP connection on the destination port 25 to mail.stevetarzy.com. The server gave a response. It said 220 grits.stevetarzy.com, ESMTP, send mail, blah, blah, blah. It gave some information about who it is. Now I, so I'm going to follow the example kind of. I'm going to say hello, stevetarzy.com. The server says hello, Murphy, which is the server I'm logged into. Pl pleased to meet you. It's kind of a, a silly way that the protocol was designed. Um, now I'm going to continue that so I've taken one step towards sending a message I'm going to send a new one mail from but I'm going to be sneaky here and I'm going to say the, the mail is from um, I mean it doesn't really matter but let's just say I'm going to impersonate our university president okay so I, I told it who the me message was from the server accepted it. Now I'm going to say who it's to. Recipient to, uh, this is Steve at steveterzy.com. That's one of the users on the system. So this the server said okay to that. And what else do I need to say? Let me just get a little cheat here. So that's actually the only person I'm going to send it to. Now I'm going to say data. Okay, so now it tells me um, enter mail, end with period on a line by itself. Okay, so great. I'm going to say from uh, from our, our fearless president. And it's to Steve. And I'm not I'm not gonna bother with a date, but I'm just gonna put a subject. Um, you're fired. Okay, all normal. Hi Steve. Sorry, but we had to let you go in Dow Mint is not big enough. Okay, tough times. Now I'm going to put a period at the end and hit enter. The server accepted the message for delivery. So this is, now remember, I, who I'm talking to here is the mail server for stevetarzy.com, so my personal domain. My, my mail server has accepted the message and it probably will deliver it. I can go and check my mail. I don't know if I should, it's wise for me to do this in the middle of a uh, live. Uh, so there it is. So I got the, uh, just, I got the message from that appears to be from uh, from our university president, and it says I think actually I should have I forgot to put angle braces around the uh, addresses, so the formatting is not quite correct, but it kind of worked. All right, so the lesson here is that um, the SMTP protocol is designed to be human operated because it was invented in 1982. That's why it's stateless, I mean stateful.
Like for example, if you were in 1983 writing a message, if you had a typo in like the to address, you would you would want the server to give you an error message before you went on to like write the whole message. That's why it's designed in this stepwise manner. Okay. We also learned that um, it's very easy to spoof email, <laughs> so um, so don't trust uh, the don't trust emails that you get. You know, in terms of like who they say they're from. And you can do this on your own. Follow the same steps. Um, of course, I'm you know please don't learn use this knowledge to uh, rip people off and cause people trouble, but use the knowledge to uh, uh, understand how to protect yourself from being scammed over email. All right, so I just uh, in this lecture we talked about application layer protocols. They're usually built on top of TCP. Uh, by doing this, the applications don't have to worry about the network itself. They just have to can create a socket connection to other hosts if they know the address of the host they're connecting to and the port that they are connecting to, port number. Um, that socket hides a lot of details from the app, uh, which which is nice. And you'll see in in project one that in order to implement your web server and client. Um, you know, you don't have to you know, worry about a lot of low-level details of the network. We talked about what a client-server architecture is that involves clients that make requests and servers that send responses. Uh, the alternative to that, the main alternative is a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, which has everyone acting as a client and server in some sense. Like everyone can send messages and listen for, for messages and send responses. It's a more scalable kind of design, but it's more difficult to organize because you have to figure out how to locate all the different parties that you might need to contact instead of waiting for them to contact your one central location. We talked a lot about HTTP. This was invented for fetching web documents on web servers, but now it's used for the basis of lots of request response interactions. I should note it's not the only option. There are alternatives like um, thrift and protocol buffers that sometimes make more sense than HTTP in special cases, but HTTP is the most common uh, used uh, protocol for request responses in general. It relies on using URLs and a request method has response status and it has human readable headers that are like that are in plain text and there's a body in, usually in the resp responses. REST API is built on top of HTTP. So we can actually think of HTTP as not just an application but also a layer that, that other applications can build on top of. It's kind of unique in that way. We also showed an, uh, a, like a different kind of application, another example, which was the mail protocol, SMTP, which was invented more earlier, um, and it's different than HTTP because it's stateful, and um, yeah, it's meant to be human operated, so it also is human readable, uh, interestingly. All right, so that's about all it, and that should be enough for you to do project one. So um, I hope you... Have, get started with that as soon as possible because it's uh, there's a lot of work there.